hadn't heard, the heard experts that. Are saying I, I like to hear that because it's something that's near and dear to my heart, and I would like for Mr. Chairman maybe to come back uh, monthly and give us updates. Would that be appropriate? Is that something well, you can do? We'll be happy to, to do that. Dr. White is or, yeah, Mr. Um, White, here. Anyway. Dr. White's here anyway. I mean, that update could come through him. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Pringle. Ms. Haskell? Thank you, sir. Through the chair, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, I hear in my everyday work directly from boaters what they think the city needs and what it would take to make the waterways more useful to them, but I hardly know where to start. How do we contact you or how do we get on the steering committee or whatever we have to do to help you learn what they're saying? Well, certainly you can simply refer people to me. Um, but we'll have a, as soon as we have the web page, we can start sending people there where they'll have a little bit of the story, and the story will continue to be told as the planning process unfolds. Um, that will direct them to the survey, and then we're going to do our best to get, the, the, there'll be an online survey so anybody can do it. You don't have to be part of a stakeholder group. Um, hopefully, um, it will be inclusive enough, and we can be expansive enough. We'll use social media. We'll do our best to get it out there to, to anybody. We're, but we're going to try to make it easy for you to refer anybody who's interested to par participate. Uh, yes, sir, uh, th ma'am, through the chair. We also can do things like have you have a little booth at the boat show where you can hand out the surveys, collect the surveys. Is that something that you'd be interested in? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, and I'll get in touch with you. Thank you. Once the meetings are scheduled with the CPACs and the community organizations, um, is there a possibility that that information could be provided to all the boat dealers in Jacksonville? That I mean, some sort of sign or something that could be posted in their office and or at boat ramps? Mr. Suber, I see you waving your hand. Yes, that, actually we have a mechanism which uh, Ms. Haskell alluded to, the boat show, but uh, Jacksonville Marine Association, which is an association of all of the local dealers and marine businesses along with the Commodores Lee. I mean, all that is going to be involved in, in helping us get the uh, information and the surveys out to the boating community. Okay. And what about signage at the boat ramps when the community meetings are scheduled so that boaters using the ramp will be aware of the survey and or the community meetings that are upcoming and... I mean, there's probably no better place to find a boater than at a boat ramp. That would be a good, yes, sir. Yeah. It's a great idea, and we'll do it. Okay. All right. Um, anything else, Ms. Haskell? Did you have another question? Okay, all right. Well, thank you for being here. We thank appreciate you. it, and we look forward to the uh, monthly updates. Ms. Meeks, Ms. Meeks, I'm going to hang. We're, we're going to skip over your presentation. Sorry. So if you want to. Okay, all right. Yeah, we're going to temporarily pass over item four and go to item five. Uh, this is uh, Ms. Megan Folletti, the Outreach Coordinator for the Division of Marine Fisheries and Management. And Mr. Pringle, this may be an exciting presentation as well. Mr. Uh, Pringle, I think you have one of everything on your shirt today. <laughs> All right, and this is the uh, PowerPoint that you'll be dealing with. It's the, uh, the lionfish invasion. Yeah, okay. you gotta, it's going to look like that. That's fine. Okay. It clicks through the same way. It clicks through the same way. Say again? It clicks through the same way. Hey, or you can do this. You can do that way. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Megan Folletti. I'm with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission um, within the Division of Marine Fisheries Management. Um, and we recently... Um, we're introduced to this alien invader of sorts um, in Florida waters um, about 30 years ago, 1985 it was first introduced, um, and it is posing a threat to our native species and it's, it's a cause for concern. So we have amped up our outreach efforts and try to get as many uh, divers and watermen involved, boaters as, as we can, as well as the general public. So there are many ways for people to get involved in, in combating this invasion. Can everyone see the PowerPoint okay? Okay. So lionfish, as I said, they're a non-native invasive species, originally from the Indo-Pacific, um, but are very popular within the aquarium trade. These fish are absolutely beautiful, ornate fish, uh, very cool to look at, and um, 
they're very easy to take care of as well. Unfortunately, they do eat a lot, they grow very rapidly, and at some point or another they were somehow released into Florida waters, um, starting in 1985 uh, down in southeastern Florida. Since then, uh, they have rapidly expanded uh, throughout the Atlantic, the Caribbean, and the Gulf of Mexico because they are lacking um, a natural control mechanism within this range. Um, in their native range, we're not sure what keeps the population in check, but it might be some sort of disease or parasite or some sort of predator at um, maybe the egg or larval stage that we just don't have in our waters in this hemisphere. So you can see this progression map, it's gotten a lot worse in the past 30 years and um, the 2015 map is even more surprising than the, the latest map I have on this slide here. Um, but you can see that they've expanded all the way up the Atlantic coast as far north as Rhode Island in the summertime and down all the way to Brazil. And this is due to uh, their versatility. They're very hardy fish. They can survive a wide range of temperatures, salinities, and depths. They've been found in many types of habitats, anything from natural coral reefs, um, hard bottom habitats, artificial reefs, shipwrecks, um, and even in mangroves and estuaries. So it is very concerning that these fish um, rapidly reproducing, that eat a wide variety of fish and invertebrates, can also live in a variety of habitats. Very impressive invader that's very well adapted. And in addition to all of that, their densities in their invaded range are exceeding those in their native range because they're lacking that control mechanism. As I mentioned, they do reproduce very rapidly. Uh, these fish can reach sexual maturity within one year of age, so that puts them at about six inches in length or so. Um, and they can reach up to about 18 inches, so three times that size. Um, they're spawning anywhere from about 30,000 up to 100,000 eggs every spawn. And this can happen as frequently as every two days in the summertime. Another downside to this fish, uh, they actually have venomous spines, which do a very good job at protecting them from predators. They've got 13 spines across the top and five along their belly. Um, their very large frilly pectoral fins you see on the side are actually harmless. They use these to corral their prey into a corner. Um, but these spines are just for defense. They don't use them aggressively. Um, but they do hurt a lot. So getting stung feels like a very bad wasp sting. I've personally been stung myself. It was not fun. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but the, the symptoms are pain and swelling. Um, and first aid for a lionfish sting would be to immerse the wound in hot, non-scalding water for as long as you can stand. And that heat actually breaks down the protein-based neurotoxin that's in the venom. And this helps a lot with uh, pain reduction as well. Some allergic reactions have been reported, but there have been no reported deaths. So as long as you can withstand the pain for a little while and make your way to a hospital if something's wrong, everything should be all right. As I mentioned, they do consume a wide variety of native fish and invertebrate species, um, economically important species and ecologically important species. Um, so we found some very strange things in their diet, but some of the most surprising are uh, juvenile groupers and snappers. Um, juvenile yellowtail snappers, I was very disappointed to hear, and juvenile flounders, which I was also upset to hear. Um, but they also consume things like juvenile spiny lobsters and shrimp, things that are very important to us commercially and recreationally. They're also eating ecologically important species such as grazers and cleaners, which either clean algae off of the reefs or clean parasites off of our native fish to maintain the health of our ecosystems. So a lot of studies have been done to see what the effects are going to be from this invader. Um, we've seen significant declines in reef fish populations in the Bahamas. There are multiple studies going on here in the state of Florida to find out what exactly we should expect. But we do have a very wide variety of habitats um, here in Florida. So it's, it's hard to tell region by region what the effects are going to be. Um, but they do have the potential to cause some harm. Easiest way to remove them, um, Florida Fish and Wildlife highly encourages divers to get involved in removing lionfish, but the easiest way to remove them is actually by going scuba diving, getting in the water, and going after them with a spear. It's not too easy to catch them on hook and line, um, but some people have done it. They've learned how to target them using very small baits. 
And if you do drop a hook down on a very high density uh, lionfish site, you're bound to catch one eventually. But as I mentioned, the easiest way to target them is with a spear. Um, you can go down with a spear or a net and actually target individual fish. Um, FWCs try to make it a little bit easier for people to go out there and get them. You no longer need a recreational fishing license to harvest lionfish. You can go out there without a fishing license with a pole spear and harvest as many fish as you want. No size limit, no bag limit. We have a couple different ways of reporting lionfish. I'm not going to get too much into this, but we do have an app, which is kind of cool, that has a map on it. And you can see all the reports that we've um, compiled across the state of Florida. And FWC has gotten a lot more involved in lionfish derbies. So these are a lot of fun. A lot of people gather together to get involved in these, and it's um, significantly grown in the past few years. So these started in about 2009 down in the Keys. There was a handful here or there. Uh, last year, there was about 15. And in 2015, we've had over 30 lionfish derbies just in the state of Florida, one of which was actually held here in Jacksonville in August and set the state record for 2,584 lionfish removed in one day. It was pretty remarkable. So I actually sent a link to a YouTube video to Jessica to share with you all um, of me and my dive buddy actually underwater harvesting these fish. It's a lot of fun, um, but it's pretty remarkable how many fish um, we were able to find just off of the Northeast Florida area. So prizes are given at these lionfish derbies for the most lionfish caught, as you can imagine, as well as the largest and the smallest fish. So um, <laughs> we want people to target all size ranges, not just the big ones, because you know in a couple months this guy might be reproductively active, and we want to make sure we're removing all size ranges of these fish. One benefit to lionfish is they do taste very good. So they, they're nice white flaky meat. Um, I did mention those venomous spines earlier that do uh, look a little scary, but as long as you're avoiding the spines, um, the venom does not affect the meat of the fish at all. So you can fillet it just like any other fish. It's very similar to hogfish or snapper. It's very good. I was actually here in August and we actually were able to, to eat some at my last presentation, which was great. Um, they're not too easy to find in seafood markets or grocery stores, although you can special order them from Publix now. But a lot of restaurants around the state of Florida are starting to serve them as a special, at least. Um, we're encouraging divers to get more involved in the commercial market to help sustain that um, commercial supply. But most of the time, it's just used as a special. If they can get a bunch of fish in one day, they'll have it for one night, and they usually sell out because it's so popular. So if you see it on the menu, definitely give it a try. I'd highly recommend it. Um, FWC actually saw this as such a concern that we declared a national or a statewide lionfish removal and awareness day. It's the first Saturday after Mother's Day each year. I'm not going to get too much into this, but uh, we did host, host a, a festival in Pensacola. Um, Guy Harvey was there. We had a blast. We had a tournament. And there were actually 12 other tournaments that hosted their tournaments that weekend um, in celebration of this. So here's some pictures from our event in Pensacola. There's Guy Harvey and the mayor of Pensacola holding a lionfish. But it was a lot of fun. Had a lot of family-friendly activities going on, a lot of educational opportunities at that festival, and we're hoping to expand next year. Uh, just a quick slide about our Reef Rangers Lionfish Control Program. This is a way for divers to get involved, and it's almost like an adopt-a-highway program where divers pick and choose which reefs they want to clean lionfish off of. Here's a little sneak preview of our website and that map that I mentioned earlier where all the reports can be seen. And we're going to continue uh, to do this to encourage divers to get more involved in lionfish removals. Um, and we're actually developing a state-specific uh, lionfish control plan. There have been several of them adapted or developed on a national level and an international level, and we're hoping to uh, focus a little bit closer to the statewide level to see what specifically needs to be done here in Florida. And we're continuously looking for more ways to make it easier for divers to get involved. And with that, I will take questions if you have any, but I also have a lionfish here with me that I'd like to show you. But if you have any questions in the meantime, I'll take them now. I thought I, thought I saw you walk up. I thought it was your lunch pail that you'd brought with you. Um, where are you from? You're, where are you based out of? I'm based out of Tallahassee. Okay. 
And are these uh, are these fish? Do you, do you have to be careful handling them after they're out of the water, or is, is the yeah, threat? Yeah, you, you can possibly get stung after they've been removed from the water. Okay. Um, they do lose a little bit of potency, but it is still dangerous to handle them. All right, so I'll hold this above the cooler so it doesn't drop all over the place. But here's a lionfish here. It does have the 13 venomous spines that you can see across the top. And then there's five on their belly as well. There's two up in the front and three back in the back. But these on the side, these big frilly pectoral fins are harmless. Um, but this meat here is a nice white flaky meat. As I said, it's very similar to hogfish or snapper. So they're kind of scary looking out of the water, but um, they do taste good. So if you, if you ever see it in a restaurant, definitely give it a try. And, and uh, is that what you, what you would describe as a medium-sized? Yeah, this is about average size. Okay. Um, they do get, as I said, up to about 18 or 19 inches. Do we need to take a temporary recess so that everybody can get their photo taken with the lionfish? <laughs> you can. I can stick around afterwards it. if yeah. you really want to touch it. But <laughs> well, we appreciate you being here. I do have some uh, commissioners with questions. Um, Mr. Swan? Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, Given the wide range in habitat, you know, and, and it sounds like they're very opportunistic, it, do you think that these derbies and the efforts that have been undertaken are, are impacting the population at all? On a local level, there have actually been studies done on these derbies to see how effective they're actually um, being. As long as the removals are happening on a regular basis, um, they do seem to have an effect on a local scale. So, for example, um, these started in uh, Key Largo. In a lot of the Key Largo area, you won't see any lionfish on a dive, especially within recreational dive limits, um, because these removals are happening so frequently. Actually, throughout the Keys, it's pretty difficult to find lionfish unless you go uh, further offshore in deeper waters, um, past 100 feet or so, where is where you start to see those densities start popping up, because you're getting out of that um, regular diving range. Um, but overall, we're not really going to make an impact. They're not going anywhere. Eradication is kind of off the table at this point. Um, but if we can um, utilize those local removals as a way to keep them away from important nursery habitats or other important habitats that we, that we know of, such as estuaries, um, then we could probably protect those areas at least. Oh, thanks. And um, kind of along those lines, if, if, have you guys documented any decline in the snapper grouper complex in terms of that can be attributed to lionfish? No, not necessarily. It's very hard to measure, but um, we can't necessarily attribute any declines to specifically from lionfish either. No, that's encouraging anyhow. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And, and we have no idea how the population is controlled in the there's a lot of research being done, um, most of it here in the invaded range. Um, not a lot has been done in their native range because they're so rare um, in their native range in the Indo-Pacific that they, they were never a cause for concern before. Um, their eggs are thought to actually be chemically defended. I don't have any scientific evidence of that yet, but some people are looking into it to see what's going on there. Um, but there's possibly some sort of disease or parasite maybe that exist in, in that side of the world that we don't have here. Well, this city has an annual um, tire and snipe sign buyback every spring, and we collect like 23,000 tires. Maybe we need to add lionfish to next year's event and see how many we <laughs> can get brought in. Mr. Pringle? Thank you, through the chair. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. George Kelly. Uh, one of the things, where, did, where did exactly do they originate? Um, anywhere from the Indian Ocean over to Australia, you can find them on the Great Barrier Reef, that region. One of the things that I think would be great is uh, maybe invite Paul Perdome to come down and fix a, a great blackened lionfish. Then well, you would. Unfortunately, you have not been keeping up with the Times Union because he passed away a oh, few <laughs> weeks ago. But a, a, type, a guy like him would come in, but. Uh, <laughs> Maybe emerald. We can emerald. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank I think you. it's great. All right, uh, Councilman Ferrero. Thank you for your presentation. I had a question. How long do uh, the lionfish live if they're not killed? 
Um, in the wild, we found up to about seven years or so, six or seven years. Um, in captivity, they've been documented to live up to uh, 15 years. Can they still produce up to seven oh, years? Yes, yeah. They're still reproducing for the rest of their life. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. Mr. Anderson? If one wanted to go looking for lionfish in northeast Florida, where would one look and why? Your best bet, I would recommend um, any of the hard bottom habitats or artificial reefs that are probably deeper than 80 feet or so. Um, I've personally gone out to a lot of the ledges and um, the culvert fields down towards the St. Augustine area that are completely covered up in lionfish. Or, or Publix, apparently. Or Publix. <laughs> um. <laughs> All right, well, we thank you for being here today. I'm, I'm assuming you made the trip over from Tallahassee. I then, did. Right? Well, we really appreciate that. Thank and, you for uh, having me. What's your, what is your background? Um, I have a bachelor's degree from Florida State in marine biology. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, we uh, certainly appreciate you making the trip and, and uh, informing us. And I guess I didn't realize how... Uh, how much of a problem this was, but that, that map showing, you know, the extent of mm -hmm. the problem throughout the Caribbean and up into, I think you said as far north as where? Rhode, Rhode Island, Island in the yes. summer times. I mean, that's absolutely amazing. So I will try to do my part and look at my menus going forward and try to consume these things. Well, we appreciate that. Help? that. Okay. Uh, Jessica does have a link to that video that I mentioned, so if you'd like to take a look, um, it's very applicable to this region. So um, there's also a brochure available if you want more information. All right. Thank you. Again, thank you very much for being here. All right, uh, moving on to item six, we have a presentation on the Central Florida Water Initiative. This is Dr. Shortell, who is the current executive director of the St. John's uh, River Management, St. John's River Water Management District. Uh, we also have a copy of that presentation in your packet. I believe it is this one. It may or may not be in color, but you ha should have a copy of it. And with that, okay. Dr. Shortell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I had absolutely no idea I would be fo following the lionfish invasion, and I promise if I'm ever invited back that I will bring props from the uh, upper Florida aquifer. Um, as you may be aware, I'm relatively new as the executive director in, at uh, St. John's River Water Management District. Uh, so I've brought reinforcements today since I may or may not be able to answer all of your questions uh, at, in, the, in the way that I would like to in the future. Uh, in addition to my staff, I want to particularly introduce to you two gentlemen that have made a long trip today uh, separately to, to help to back me up. As you'll soon learn, the Central Florida Water Initiative uh, includes three water management districts and uh, Robert Beltran from Southwest Florida Water Management District, their executive director is here today and also Len Lendahl from South Florida Water Management District. Uh, he's an uh, assistant executive director. Thank you all for being here with us. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, comforting to me. So when you have questions, they w may be the ones who are actually answering the questions. OK, how do I advance this? Click arrow. I'm on the arrows. Just keep pressing. I'm sorry. I mean, I can't even operate the machinery. Now's when I need the props, right? I actually have a core. You'll see a picture of uh, the upper Florida and aquifer and kind of our, our karst uh, environment that's beneath our feet. We ready to go? I could, but let, I'll give it my best shot. Um, but, and I've got a piece of that on my desk, but I dang didn't bring it with me. I should have. OK. Everybody see that OK? Um, one of the things about Florida is we're literally surrounded by water, and we're not an arid place. 
we get lots and lots of rainfall. Even when we're in drought, we're, it's not arid. It's never arid. Uh, this state, on average, uh, over 50 inches of rain annually. Uh, and if you just do the math on the area of the state, it's a lot of water. Um, we get it at inconvenient times. It's in a tropical storm, and everyone's calling our phones and your phones and complaining that they're flooding. Or it gets uh, dry, and then everybody's calling and saying, oh my gosh, you know, my, my lake's down six feet, eight feet, or more. Uh, so we have lots and lots of beautiful surface waters. Um, I'm very uh, uh, understanding of and a fan of uh, regions that identify specifically with their local water resources. It, it's emblematic of who we are as a people, as a community, um, and it's understandable that that's where our focus is. For the water management districts, we tend to focus also on the water that's beneath our feet because that defines the majority of our water supply. That's where the majority of our water comes from, from the Florida aquifer system, which is literally beneath our feet. And more than 90% of the water that all of us use comes from that source. Uh, whether it's an upper Florida or lower Florida or superficial, uh, it's not really the issue specifically today, but rather the understanding that we don't see that supply like we see our beautiful rivers and springs and lakes. Um, but it's down there, and it is uh, active, and it responds to rainfall inputs and outflows uh, just like the, the lakes and rivers and springs do. It's very, very unusual to be in a state that is this highly dependent on groundwater. There's only a handful. So if you think about 50 states, very few of them are highly dependent on groundwater like we are. So topic, first major topic of today, where we're really talking primarily today about uh, water supply planning. And you've been reading and hearing about uh, the big planning effort that is currently going on in Central Florida. And this is the map of that area. Uh, it's primarily five counties. And uh, you can see the water management district boundaries here, which explains for you why um, the, I've got two other, the two other largest water management districts here with me today. So our water management districts and Florida water law is predicated on our uh, surface water basins. Absolutely uh, uh, understandable, makes a lot of sense. We're in the St. John's River Water Management District because that's our surface water basin, but beneath our feet, the groundwater doesn't really behave in that same way. There's no boundary down there. There are uh, potentiometric boundaries that change which way the groundwater is flowing, but they don't match the surface water boundaries. And that uh, understanding is only uh, recently, last decade or two, beginning to kind of percolate into uh, how we think about our water supply and how we begin to manage uh, with that knowledge. So in the central Florida region where we have Orlando and lots of people, uh, we're talking about three water management districts that had been operating pretty independently with regard to how they permit that groundwater. But if the groundwater is not responding like the surface water basins, which we know that it does not, it became essential that we join together and begin to plan for this area of our state cooperatively. And that cooperation has literally been going on for 15 years. You may or may not have heard about it in a, a prior iteration. The current iteration has been going on since about 2011, 2012. Uh, it includes not only the three water management districts, but DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, DACs, 
um, Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, our uh, uh, water users, so utilities that are in that area, environmental groups, um, all of the stakeholders, all of us are water users, so we're essentially we're all stakeholders. And it brings all of us together for this planning process. The planning process is set forth for us in Florida statute, and, and this is what you have been uh, perhaps reading and hearing about. I do want to um, read one. I'm not a big fan of reading things, but and if you go to the website about uh, this planning process, uh, you may be overwhelmed as I have been by the you know literally thousand pages that are associated with the plan, the science, and the underpinning, and then the plans forward for water conservation and, and projects and and other parts of the solution for 20 years uh, forward, the water that we need. But I think this one sentence out of the uh, out of the conclusions begins to tell you why we are uh, joined together and uh, focused on this plan. Traditional groundwater resources alone cannot meet all future water demands or currently permitted allocations without resulting in unacceptable impacts to water resources and related natural systems. So that uh, is sort of the this one sentence that's the poster child of why we're engaged in, you know, 200 scientists and uh, policymakers and others in this planning process. I don't know if I mentioned that I'm a scientist. I am. Uh, I'm a limnologist, so surface water, fresh water is, is my uh, area of expertise. Um, and you can't take, you know, the scientist out of the girl, even if I'm more of an administrator now. I tend to speak in graphs and charts. So I'm going to show you a few things here, because the work that is being done in this process, and indeed all the processes that we do, is underpinned first and foremost by the science. And this is a, a graphic that shows over time in the central Florida area, so those five counties, the historic water use uh, versus the population. You can see the population growing over time. This is a, a you know, a 10, well, 15 year view, 15 ish year view of water use. You can see that it's dominated by public supply and by agriculture. Those are the, the uh, two bottom largest bars. And then you can see the other four categories there. And you can begin to see five, six, seven years ago. Uh, a, a change that the the water use was not really following the population growth, and this we attribute to a, a number of things. Uh, first and foremost, water conservation, water conservation and water reuse, uh, and water efficiencies being brought online by utilities, being uh, incentivized. Uh, by water management districts for agriculture, for water users, for, for uh, uh, in-home uh, water use and irrigation and the like. And what we know from these data, we don't know every detail, but what we do know is that the per capita use, and that means the amount of water on average that's used in, in a home by a person, uh, has gone down by nearly 40% during that time period. Um, you know, for one house it might be because they, they're, uh, they've turned off their outdoor irrigation. For others it, it might be because they've retrofitted their toilets and other things. Uh, but water conservation is the first line of a defense for uh, water supply planning and, and sustainability, and we don't want to lose sight of that. So here really is the challenge. Well, let me let me mention one more thing. If uh, for some of uh, some of you who may have been following that we had our uh, governing board uh, meeting uh, for the St. John's district here in the area yesterday, and yesterday our board um, 
uh, voted affirmatively 9-0 to proceed with $4 million worth of springs uh, funding for water conservation in two areas, in, in the Central Florida Water Initiative area, but also in this area, our planning area, which I'll show you uh, in just a couple of minutes. So this really is the challenge. Uh, currently, about 800 million gallons a day is being used in the Central Florida area. We believe, uh, our scientists tell us from the data that we have uh, and the models that we have built uh, and calibrated to that area, that there might be about 50 million gallons a day more from the traditional groundwater sources that, that could be used. But when we look over the 20-year planning horizon, which is how we plan for water supply, we know that the population will grow and the projections that we use tell us that we need more than 50 million gallons a day. We need an additional, on top of that, 250 million gallons a day. And those have to come from alternate supplies. Alternate supplies, uh, as I mentioned, first and foremost, can be and should be water conservation. Typically, that's considered the low-hanging fruit. And we know that in the Central Florida area, a lot of that work is already happening. Uh, but we can always do more, and we will do more, because uh, not only is it the right thing to do, it's, it, it's everybody's job to save the next drop when we can, but it's also typically the least expensive next drop. So water conservation tends to get uh, pushed fastest and hardest uh, when we're talking about these, these planning efforts, and everybody gets on that bandwagon, uh, I'm happy to say. The other option for water suppliers and water users is to bring on alternative supplies. Uh, and these can take many, many forms. Um, one of the ones that I know has caught the attention of this area, and rightly so, is uh, surface water. And basically what I want you to know about a plan is when, when the water management districts uh, uh, together with our stakeholders do a water supply plan. We have folks bring potential conceptual projects to the table for consideration. When you look at the uh, plan as it's currently drafted, there's about twice as many potential projects uh, to produce finished water than is actually needed in that 20-year horizon. This is a good thing because over time, projects get considered, and some of them fall by the wayside because they can't, you know, they don't make economic sense, they're not going to work for whatever reason. So I don't want anybody to think just because something is in a plan that it's going to be built, uh, certainly not in the near future. One of the most important things about the planning process is the realization that when we're talking about uh, water supply projects, Number one, they, they don't get built overnight. Uh, typical planning horizon to get to the, to the actual built stage is a decade or longer. So these plans have a long planning horizon. We need to spur people, uh, utilities, uh, other water users into action, into movement, into planning, into looking at whether or not that engineering will really work. So we have these maps that have literally like 150 possible projects on there. Does it mean they'll all be built? Certainly not, because they won't all be needed. Uh, some of them will likely be built. Um, which ones? I, I, I don't know. Might others be brought in instead? Absolutely. But there are f five uh, surface water projects that are uh, in this plan, and of interest to you, three of them are on the uh, St. John's River. F much further upstream, you know, down closer to this uh, planning area where the water is fresher. Um, in anticipation of potential need for surface water uses over time, the St. John's River Water Management District uh, about 
Well, let's see. I think it actually the study was done, started maybe about 2009, 2010, was finished um, a year or two after that and accepted by that by the St. John's Board. Uh, it's, a, it's the most comprehensive hydrologic ecological study of the river that's been done to date. It's about whether or not water can be used from the river, and if so, how much. Uh, and that, is, that, along with our minimum flows and levels, are what guide what can uh, and might uh, in the future be used. Um, it sounds like huge numbers when we talk about one, two, three withdrawals that might be, you know, 150 million gallons a day sounds massive. Flowing out the mouth down here is three and a half to four and a half billion gallons a day. So that just puts it in perspective. I don't uh, mean to, to minimize that these aren't big projects and that they're not things that you want to be mindful of and uh, uh, asking questions about. I just want you to be able to put those ideas into perspective. This is perhaps my favorite slide. When I, I, I really was, I came from the Swanee River Water Management District, and uh, there we were all about springs and the Swanee River and the Santa Fe River and those beautiful water resources. When I uh, got here, I realized we had uh, very significant challenges along the East Coast in the Indian River Lagoon. There was something approaching an ecological collapse in 2011, which has spurred a tremendous amount of work recently. Uh, but there are, are projects, engineered projects, going on behind the scenes that have been going on for literally two decades that begin to frame uh, some of your concerns in a different light. We have, in our district, uh, at least 13 primary canals that cut across that uh, divide from the upper St. John's into the Indian River Lagoon. This was what was done back in the day, in the 1920s, in the 1960s. If you could cut that canal in and ditch and drain, you had property that you could develop or you could farm or use. Uh, these were wetlands. Um, so those canals are taking water literally from the St. John's River Water Management District, or from the St. John's River watershed through the Indian River Lagoon watershed and into the Indian River Lagoon. It's not healthy for the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, and wouldn't we, in fact, like to have clean additional waters that we were in the St. John's River back? And the answer to that is yes. And in fact, the district and the uh, Army Corps back in the day, they helped with uh, some of the land purchases, have spent about $2,200 million already on this project. And, and those are the first four projects that you can see on this graphic. Uh, we've already got about 56 million gallons a day of flow restored from those Indian River Lagoon drainage canals back into the upper portion of the St. John's. And there's a lot more work to do. So if you think about it, this isn't really the way the river works, but if you think about it in a simple way, you pour more water in on the front end, on the upper end, you may take a, some out, that 150, if all three projects were built as withdrawals, uh, along the way, you, you end up with something that's still pretty balanced down at the mouth of the river here in Jacksonville. Um, there's one very large project, it's number five on this list, which uh, is also in the Central Florida Water Initiative plan. It is actually in the South Florida Water Management District, uh, dealing with water from the C-25 canal it's one proposal, there are others, for water that can be, again, garnered from canals that are, are going to tide and bringing that water, cleaning it, uh, and getting it 
into the upper uh, basin of the St. Johns River. So that's one of the projects. One of those five water, surface water projects that I was telling you about is actually to put uh, nearly 140 million gallons a day back in to the St. Johns River, at least uh, uh, a goodly portion of that. So we have our eye on this. If anybody uh, doesn't believe that we aren't really dead-eye focused, not only on the water supply, but on the water resources and their health, uh, we, we have the authority and are doing through our permitting process and other ways. Um, many, many, many projects uh, to, to improve the St. Johns River and all of our other water resources. Now let's turn our attention a little bit more locally uh, because just as the Central Florida needs to plan for water supply, so do we here in, in this particular area. And you may be aware that in 2011, uh, the, th the two water management districts, St. John's and Suwannee River Water Management District, joined with DEP and, and, and uh, this planning area for the same sort of process because we need that planning process for our water supply here in this area, just like they do in the central part of the state. That, that uh, includes stakeholder involvement. There are, uh, I'll say monthly meetings. They tend to be monthly meetings, but every once in a while they skip one month. Um, so more or less, you know, nine, 10 meetings a year so far with uh, stakeholders from environmental groups, from agriculture, from utilities, water, water users, and uh, uh, environmental groups, like I said, to help in that planning process. Um, I would urge you to become engaged with this, uh, and, and you will see that this planning process is well on its way. We expect to have a draft of that uh, cross-boundary to water management district um, plans uh, in, in the spring of late spring, early summer of next year, and so this is this is very timely because everybody's focused on Central Florida right now, but the spotlight is going to be shifting here uh, in very short order. I thought you might be interested in the same sort of water use graphic that I showed for Central Florida uh, for Duval County. Again, this is historic water use with the, with the uh, six water use types, and it's got the population on there. Um, here you have, in this county, uh, the agricultural component is, is quite a bit smaller than it is in Central Florida. The dominant use is uh, public supply, utility public supply, not self-supply. Self-supply is the little green, or the little uh, orange part of the bar. So those are folks that have their own well, perhaps out on the country that don't have uh, city water. But it's very striking to me that you see that same sort of uh, water uh, conservation response here as you do in Central Florida. Part of that is a, it has to do with, with the climate and how much rain and how much do we have to water, but it's more than that. Uh, and in fact, if you drill into the numbers, you will find that this area, uh, in our planning area here in the north, is actually doing a little bit better uh, than the central Florida area on a per capita basis. So kudos in this area um, on, on that point for water conservation. Now, what's, what is water reuse? Uh, wa w wastewater, we all use water. If, if we're on central sewer, that water goes to a wastewater treatment plant, and then that water is cleaned up, and it has to go somewhere. It's already out of the aquifer. It could go to what we call purple pipes, and the purple pipes distribute that water for other uses, maybe to a golf course, maybe, maybe to supplement some other supply, maybe to be used in uh, uh, outdoor irrigation, whatever it is. In this graphic, which is our entire district, the good color is purple. That's the water that's coming out of the wastewater treatment plants that is being beneficially 
reused. It's about 30 percent of the of the public supply water, um, so it's very important to put that to beneficial reuse. Uh, green in on this graphic means it's just being disposed of, um, and that can take many forms. But a typical one is uh, kind of old school: put it in the river, and then it's out to tide. Um, I wanted you to see this because although. Uh, water conservation, you guys get thumbs up. You might want to look at the color in this area and, and ask yourselves, what's our next project for water reuse? I will tell you that this, these data, which are in the Senate Bill 536 um, report, the statewide report that, that's recently out, are not up to date. These are 2010. And in this area, you would have a little bit more uh, purple on your map if it was updated to today. So I don't, wanna, I don't want you to have the impression that we're not recognizing the good work that is ongoing because it is ongoing. But in this area, about 15% beneficial reuse. And in Orange County, in the central heart of the Central Florida Water Initiative, 80% beneficial reuse. So that area has already put a tremendous amount of uh, resource into that drought-proof quantity. Because if you think about it, it's already out of the ground. You clean it up in the wastewater treatment plants. That's drought-proof. People are taking those showers and flushing those toilets even when the supplies are limited by drought. There's a lot of good things to talk about in our area. Uh, in the past uh, several years, uh, nearly $90 million uh, invested in a variety of projects. Many, many, many of them in this area are for the uh, water quality improvement in the lower St. Johns River, and, and well, they should be. Uh, this uh, NAS Jacksonville Navy project, number five, uh, yeah, five on the list, is uh, one that there'll be a ribbon cutting tomorrow on. That's a reuse project in, in part, and it's, it's a great story. You have a lot to celebrate here. Uh, so I, I didn't want to be the, you know, uh, I didn't want to leave on a note of we're not all in this together and we're not all doing our part because a lot of super good work has been done in this arena and continues to be done. One of the things that I'm proud to be able to be associated with uh, at St. John's River Water Management District is our cooperative funding program, which uh, is, is dominated by cost share projects with local governments. Um, this year, we doubled, uh, our governing board doubled our expenditures. This map shows you the, the project uh, layout that's been uh, awarded $25 million of ours, parlayed into something more like $75 million in projects overall. They run the gamut. There's water quality projects there. There's uh, water supply projects. There's water conservation, all sorts of things. And five projects uh, are funded in Duval County. Three of them are water quality. One is water conservation. And one is for the city of Jacksonville, actually, is, is a drainage project. Uh, that's funded for this year. I also want you to be aware that there's an upcoming opportunity uh, in part for ready communities uh, that didn't compete very well uh, with the big boys, so to speak, uh, in the first round, but also for innovative projects. And uh, I will just bet that we're going to get some good um, submittals from this area if you've got your thinking caps on about innovative uh, water conservation, stormwater harvesting, and the like. So it's important that we're all dependent on water, uh, and our water resources are dependent on water. We can't afford to have anyone uh, that is unaware or unwilling to participate. Uh, that is why so much time and energy is put towards collaboration but I also want to say it's not just about the talk, it's about the walk. We've got to marry the collaboration with action. 
and there's a lot of action in this area i'm i'm happy to say so i don't want to minimize that but i also don't want you to think that we don't have work to do we just need to do it together and with all of our water users voices heard and also protecting our beautiful water resources and we will do that now we can direct any questions at the pleasure of the chair to someone else <laughs> all right well we will probably have a few questions again thank you for being here and you for making your presentation I did have a question about I think what you said was one of your favorites graphs yes um, you had two in here that were I guess submitted for a comparison purpose uh, the Central Florida Water Initiative uh, yes, consumption sir. rates compared to Duval County. So exactly how do you procure these different portions of these vertical graphs? Uh, I'm assuming maybe the uh, public um, supply you ascertain from billings from water utility companies? The, the utilities submit that information. They're required by permit uh, uh, on, on the front end for us and on the back end for DEP. They've, they've got reporting. Re uh, what about the agriculture segment? Agriculture is uh, metered for large users. Uh, it, I mean, what you see on that graphic is, is uh, all the data that we have and estimates where we don't have. So we may have, you may have a large agriculture operation and they're metered and we have that data by permit, but next door might be three or four smaller guys that have um, smaller uses. We have information, they don't necessarily, if they're tiny, they're not necessarily metered. And the domestic small supply or self-supply? Those, those are, are estimates. Those are purely estimates. Yes. Now, they're not, you know, uh, completely off the reservation. I mean, there are studies that are done that, that uh, give us pretty good information on average. Mm -hmm. Of course, nothing's average. So it's not exact, but it's, it's pretty doggone good, the uh, dense, density of data behind these estimates. Uh, and then we're projecting out 20 years. So um, those numbers are also, I mean, they're projections. Okay. And what do you attribute this downturn here on the, on the uh, water initiative counties uh, beginning in 2006, dropping from like a little north of 900 million gallons a day down to what you report in 2013 is 700 million gallons. Yes, a day. sir, and you can see some of that in the in the Duval graphic as well. So there there are water. The amount of water we get in a particular year does matter uh, because if the number is uh, looking at um, if you're looking at public supply people are watering their lawns less if it's raining. Um, so you see that signal in there a little bit. You see the signal of water reuse. More, more water reuse offsets groundwater pumping and, and dampens out that uh, use at people's houses or a big project that uh, recycles in industry. Industry's made tremendous so strides. We're not, and we're not attributing that to conservation or anything, it's just... And uh, conservation. And, and cons conservation. conservation is, I think, a big signal in there. When you look at the per capita numbers, so this is now residential people's, what they're using at their houses, that per capita number, both in Duval County and in the Central Florida Water Initiative, has dropped by a lot. Um, and a portion of that is certainly due to water conservation. And um, would the rainfall that you're talking about, public supply, people watering their yards less, wouldn't that directly impact agricultural use as well? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I noticed that when I divide the current um, water consumption for the water initiative counties by the population and compare that to the same numbers for Duval County, 
they're about 50% higher per person than we are. What would you attribute that to? Um, I think I have the residential numbers. I don't have well, the I'm just using what you provided on yeah, the graph. Yeah, I don't uh, have the gross per capita numbers. I'm guessing that $700 million on the water initiative, dividing that by about 2.8 million people, I come up with about uh, 245 gallons per person. Those would be the gross numbers, and there are, I, of course, I can't. And what I do is the same math for Duval County using 140 million gallons a day divided by 850,000 people. I come up with 164.7, which is about 50% more for the water initiative. Yes. Yes. So, uh, thank you. Oh, gosh. Apparently, whole team's apparently here. I need a lifeline. No, no, no. <laughs> Okay, so Len was pointing out that there's a large signal of agriculture that's in the Central Florida Water Initiative that you don't have here. Um, and that, so that would be one thing. Also in Central Florida, it's, I mean, think of Disney with, you know, mouse ears. There's a, a fairly large, I mean, a l very large signal of seasonality. Those aren't residents, so they don't get counted in the population. but people that come and they're using water, of course, while they're here, so that makes a difference as well. But if you look at the residential numbers, you are still correct. The numbers per capita residentially here, they've, they've dropped in both places. Uh, but here, they are lower than they are in, uh, in that central Florida region. So they have more work to do, and we all have more work to do. All right, questions from the commissioners. Uh, Mr. Godfrey? Yes, thank you. And uh, through the chair, um, in looking at graphs like this, uh, I also wonder whether you have an economic component in it. It looks like to me the two points that tend to peak on there are also the peaks of a, uh, a business cycle. And the slow growth uh, since the last one may simply be the uh, very sluggish recovery. I would also ask you, I have not heard any mention of using the pricing system to discourage uh, overuse of water. You could certainly do it in a tiered way where everybody gets a certain amount of, of water at a very low price, perhaps, and then incremental amounts become much more expensive, and that's one good way to get uh, conservation. You don't have to build plants. You don't have to drill more and drain it. You can let the pricing system do the heavy lifting on these kinds of things. If I've betrayed my profession, so be it. Mr. Chair, if, if I may, I, sir, I agree with you. Um, you have tiered rates here, uh, and in the Central Florida Water Initiative, do all the do they all have tiered rates now? Okay, so all of those uh, utilities also have tiered rates. They're they're absolutely proven uh, to work. I agree with you. Thank you, Mr. Godfrey. Um, Mr. Hodges, you're next. You mentioned, and we've heard it several times, uh, that the Central Florida, and I'm going to try to use what you say, um, they, in your little thing, they have more purple than we have up here, percentage in, in your little graphs. Yes, sir. In, included in that purple, I believe, and if, please correct me if I'm wrong, is beneficial reuse includes putting it in discharge, uh, recharge ponds. Is that correct? It, it, it's counted on, on the, as the beneficial re, recharge is the clean water that gets put back in the aquifer in a way that it could potentially be used again. Uh, so it excludes um, disposal methods like deep well injection that where that water wouldn't be used again. But but their purple includes where they have it used purple recharge. pipe to put it or purple pipes to run it to a pond yes. recharge area pond. Yes. And that reuse, I'm guessing, does not lower the amount of water being needed. It isn't as though they're putting it on a on, on lawns or on a golf course by putting it back. So uh, it seems to me You're correct. You know, that I'm editorializing a little bit. So it's, it is a good thing to do, but it, 
it makes it look as though they're recycling water better than we're doing up here because unfortunately, if my understanding is correct, up here we don't have the avail availability to recharge the aquifer so easily by putting it in ponds. I mean, you, you raise a good point. Not all beneficial reuse is equal. There, there are different categories. Uh, one thing I did neglect to say when I was on the map of the North Florida area, uh, which the, the map that is this area and Suwannee, is that 80% of the aquifer recharge in, this in, in that entire planning area does not happen here. It happens in the Suwannee portion of the district because that's where uh, you get that uh, ready uh, recharge uh, through the connectedness and of not having a confined aquifer. In this area, 80%, uh, 75% of the water use in the planning area is here. But you're correct in, what you, in your observation. There's a difference between a groundwater offset. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use reuse water in a way that I pump less. That's, that's an offset. Uh, or I'm going to use surface water in a way that I pump less traditional groundwater. That's one part of the calculus, if you will. But recharge, beneficial, that's back in the aquifer, because we uh, recharge is important. It's, it's how we refill that reservoir. Uh, naturally or cleaned and in a in a augmented way that's important too because that is a recycling loop if you will uh, through the chair one more question and, and I just uh, first comment is that I, I just wish that y'all when you give this presentation then use the offset rather than the more favorable comments towards Central Florida of this beneficial reuse um, that's just a comment. Another question, and once again, please correct me, this has been years since I've heard about uh, uh, discussion of the study that was done by the Water Management District, rather how it would affect withdrawals, I think a couple yes, of years sir. ago, y'all were. Yes. It, it seems to me at that time, a major conclusion of the study had more to do with if we pull out some amount of millions of gallons a day, it is not going to affect the level of the river rather than what its effect on the salinity of the river might be. That the, I seem to remember, perhaps it was your predecessor with his comments that the more we pull out at one end, it'll just fill in from the ocean. And am I incorrect in that statement? Well, it would equilibrate with the ocean. There's no doubt about that. That's why we are interested in putting more water in that should be there on the, on the upper end. But the, the study that you're referring to absolutely, absolutely looked at salinity changes and looked at ecological uh, attributes and the potential for change on those. So it's, it's more than just, you know, how might the level change. Uh, it was a much more comprehensive than that. And, and if I might, just one more, um, since you mentioned uh, the, the yellow or the green and purple graphic, the, those are just the data. Um, I'm not favoring one area over another. I understand that it, every acre isn't equal, but I, I did want to. Uh, perhaps focus a little attention in this area. So this is not, this is, that's our whole district. The story, you know, continues to unfold. It's not, and, and we don't want to be thinking them and us. I apologize for if I implied that you were doing it. It's just that I guess I'm being a little local here. That we've heard this before that the that the Central Florida area does such a one a, a better job than we do on the purple pipes, and I'm not sure it's always presented um, as it could be. But thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Swan. Uh, thank you through the chair. Um, just out of curiosity, the uh, 250 million gallon per day projected deficit in 2035, that's going to be all surface water withdrawals, do you think? Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, that, uh, no. Um, I don't even think there's enough surface water in the 
plan to cover that. The plan has about four to 500 MGD of possible projects plus water conservation. And it could be any of those. Um, that's just one option. So I know in the study that the district did looking at you know, what, a, what a sustainable withdrawal from, from the upper St. John's would be, have, they, have the other districts done something similar with the Peace River Basin and Kissimmee River Basin? I honestly don't know the answer to that. But I have them here. They can tell us. Good morning. For the record, Robert Beltran, Executive Director of the Southwest Florida Water Management District. And yes, in our district, we do utilize both surface water and groundwater as a diverse water supply source, which then provides a lot of financial security and overall resource security to the environment overall, maximizing the benefit of when that water is available to use that water in different ways that maximizes it. So yes, we all individually look at all the water resources as the three districts and look at what are the best opportunities to maximize or utilize that water for all beneficial uses, whether it's environmental uses or public uses or agricultural uses. You know, obviously there's a lot of concern about the potential withdrawals from the Upper St. John's and the impact with our SAV and, and things down here. Um, are there similar concerns with, with withdrawals from, from the Peace River and Kissimmee River in, in for the Central Florida area? Yes. Um, the yes, the Peace River is currently under recovery, but that's a long story of over pumping. And what we're trying to do with the regional water supply planning is to avoid situations that we've seen, like in the Tampa Bay area, where we were over pumping the groundwater aquifer by so much that we saw impacts occurring to our surface water features. So they do go hand in hand, although you don't see the water underneath you, as, as Dr. Shortell referred to, it does impact the overall ecology and how the systems work together collectively. So it's important that you look at it holistically. So the answer to your question is absolutely. We are constantly looking at how those two interactions work together and what do we need to do to make sure we maintain both the balance in the, lower, in the, in the upper floor and in the groundwater system and the surface water system. So we do a number of studies on all of these different uh, environmental features. No, that, that makes sense. I understand that. I was just kind of curious if could we not take water from the upper St. John's and take it from Kissimmee and the Peace River instead? The, oh if it's not as controversial. Those are also options available on the table, and I think it's important, and Dr. Schwartel alluded to this, there's about 450 million gallons identified in potential projects in the plan. And then as a regional water supply, as a district agency that provides these options to local governments, municipalities, it's important to provide those municipalities options so that they can then further explore it. Ultimately, these plans are updated every five years, so it really drives what happens over the next 10, 20 years is actual data that we see, what's really occurring, what we think will might occur, and then what really happens. At the end of the day, conservation is the most economical way of trying to resolve this issue. And economics will help drive that, that spirit. And you've seen a great drive in that matter in both, both areas that you've seen the maps today and the graphs. You see continuing focus on conservation because it is the most economical solution to this issue. That said, it's important to also provide the diversity of options to all local municipalities to make sure they can develop their future as they move forward as communities. Thanks. I sure appreciate y'all coming today. All right. Any further questions from commissioners? Just, oh, I'm sorry. You want to respond Mr. to that? Mr. Chair, if, I, yes, if I may, Len Lindahl, the Assistant Executive Director at South Florida Water Matron District, and uh, Robert Beltran touched on Southwest Florida with Peace River with regards to South Florida and the Kissimmee River. Um, we are currently doing the, the study. It's, it's a reservation for the Kissimmee River. Uh, so we're going through rulemaking, and we have that out for public comment right now. Um, so when that is complete, then that would feed in with regards to the amount of water that would be able, if you know, what would be available to feed into the Central Florida Water Initiative, and that would be incorporated, would be expected in the next update with regards to what those results would be. All right. Thank you. If you all would leave your business cards on the podium for just for our record, I'd appreciate that. Dr. Shortell, I appreciate you being here. Um, Thank you. Very enjoyable presentation. Uh, no lionfish, but you know. I'll, I can come back and I'll have I'll have props and I'll have a better graphic. Well, Mr. Wilson has you. I think he has your prop here and he's been drinking out of it uh, the entire <laughs> meeting. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you for being here. All right, Miss Meyer, are you here? 
you left me a message yesterday that really didn't say anything. So did it have something to do with this meeting today? No. Okay. Are you here for an item? Yes, for, well, for new business. Okay. Well, new business is going to be a little bit. Would you like to wait? I have a meeting at 12, sir. Uh, I have one as well. But I'm going to be here if this meeting is still underway. So let's see where we can go. Uh, item four, Ms. Uh, Meeks, let's have you take care of the... Uh, 2016 fine grant cycle, please. You also have a packet in your, uh, or a, uh, an item in your packet for today. It's got the uh, Florida Inland Navigation District logo on the cover. Good morning, Tara Meeks, Division Chief of Natural Marine Resources. Um, I'm going to run through a quick presentation with you all on the uh, proposed applications for this upcoming year's Florida Inland Navigation District grant cycle. Um, we are in the very beginning planning stages of the grant cycle projects. The grants will not be due to the find committee until um, April 1st. There are some intermediate deadlines that we have to meet as we go along. Um, but these are the projects that we are proposing to move forward with. And as we go through the coming months, we can certainly have a discussion, decide what we're going to actually move forward with. <coughs> My presentation includes a total of four projects. Um, Half Moon Island, North Shore Kayak Launch, Charles Reese Fishing Pier, and South Bank River Walk. And this gives you an idea of where each one of those projects is located within the city. The first project, North Shore Kayak Launch, is located in Council District 8. We are proposing to move forward with the application for Phase 2, which is the construction of the project, which was originally de designed with a grant that was received in 2013. The project involves stabilizing the existing shoreline and adding a kayak launch. It'll be just a shoreline kayak launch, which will have an ADA access route from the roadside parking to the kayak launch. Um, this is the final grant cycle that we are able to pursue the construction for this project. And just as a reminder for you all, um, fine grants are two-year grants. And they do have a one-year extension, so we've pursued the extension for this grant. In order to maintain the funding that we received for phase one, for the phase one grant, we do have to move forward and complete construction um, within the following two to three years, depending upon if we get an extension or not for construction. The second proposed project is Charles Reese Memorial Park Fishing Pier and Kayak Launch. This project is located in Council District 8, or I'm sorry, Council District 10. This is also the Phase 2. Um, the original project was designed with a grant that was received in 2013. The scope of this project includes building a 100-foot fishing pier and converting the existing um, boat ramp, which hasn't been used um, or adequately maintained in a number of years, converting that into a kayak launch. Um, again, this is our final year to proceed with pursuing the second phase of the grant for construction. The third project which we are proposing to move forward with an application for is Half Moon Island Preserve Boat Ramp um, and Park Development. Uh, the design for this, if you guys will think back with me, those of you who are here, we actually had this in two separate projects. We had the boat ramp facility itself and then the secondary supporting facilities kind of split out. As we move forward, we relumped them back together because it is a cost savings and we were awarded the design grant for both of those phases. The entire park has been designed and although it's a little bit small, that design is included up here. However, the cost estimate to build everything at once is quite high. And so we have worked with the design consultants to split the project out into a phase 2A and a phase 2B. At this time, we're suggesting that we move forward with phase 2A construction, 
which has a total price of about $2 million. The scope for the Phase 2A includes the construction of the boat ramp, the construction of one of the two floating docks, which you see, the entrance and the parking facilities, um, the shoreline revetments, which run on either side of the boat ramp, site clearing, grading, and the addition of the stormwater pond. In a future phase, we would propose to come in and finish out the project as it's been designed, which would include installing a fishing platform, installing the two picnic pavilions, and installing the second floating dock. This grant was also originally received in 2013 for the design, and we do need to move forward with um, a construction phase this grant cycle in order to maintain our funds received from the first phase grant. We have checked with FIND on this project and they have confirmed that the way that we've split the project into two sections fulfills our requirements to move forward with construction for both of the grants, the design grants, and so we would be satisfying all FIND requirements if we move forward with a phase 2A and a phase 2B approach. The final project that we would be proposing to move forward with for this year would be our only new project. This project would include the installation of, or I'm sorry, would include the design and permitting for a 120 foot floating dock on the South Bank River Walk over near the Chart House. This is located in Council District 5 and the estimated design cost is $166,000. And then this gives you an overview of the, the dollars that we've just gone over. Um, we're anticipating that we're going to receive about $1.4 million in fine grant dollars for Duval County in grant cycle 2016. We've spoken to Atlantic Beach and we anticipate that they are going to ask for $250,000. Therefore, the fine dollars that we feel will most likely be available to the city is $1.15 million and therefore the anticipated match on um, the projects that have been presented today would be 1.5 and that was, comes to a total cost of 2.6 million and I'm happy to take any questions you guys have. The uh, floating dock for the newly reconstructed South Bank River Walk was that not part of the original design? It was not. This would be new floating docks. The original design replaced the existing floating docks that were there um, before construction started. This would actually be new linear footage, which has never been there before. And what, what did we replace? How big is the dock that we replaced? We replaced two floating docks out there. One is 120 feet, and the other one is closer to 100 feet. I think it's 95. And this proposal is for 120 feet? This is for 120. Why don't we use the design that we already have for the one we already built instead of spending another $166,000? Um, unfortunately, it's not that easy. We have to do the permitting that's associated with it, the geotech for the area that we're actually proposing to put the floating dock because the sediment changes as you go along the river. And um, we have to do surveys of depth in order to get our permit. So we're not paying for any architectural drawings then. We're just paying for all the permitting work and stuff that's unique to that location, right? <laughs> Uh, more or less. We will design, the docks will be the similar, there will be the concrete docks like what we have currently installed, so we will provide the design consultant with the previous design and they may need to do a little bit of tweaking as to where the pilings go, but more or less it, it will not be for architectural design. And what are the 6 through 10 projects that didn't make the list? What are the six through ten projects yeah, you that didn't make one the list? Five. Are there other projects that are on oh. the table for discussion? Uh, well, one through I gave you one through four, I believe, and the first three projects are those which we've already started in the past with the design, the Half Moon Island, the North Shore, and the Charles Reese. And so those are the three projects that we need to move forward in order to recoup um, or to maintain the funding that we've already received. Other projects that we looked at as opposed to South Bank Riverwalk floating docks included we need to do, we have a variety of dredge projects. Um, there's the Harborview dredge project, Oak Harbor dredge project, um, Metro Marina dredge project. Those all have um, larger price tags than what we had funding available for. So one of the things that we looked at in suggesting the South Bank Riverwalk was 
um, how much dollars was left on the table when pursuing the first three projects. All right, Mr. Godfrey, questions? Yes, uh, through the chair. Uh, who will be able to tie up to this dock, and how long may they stay? Thank you. Um, it'll be a public dock, so it'll be public recreation vessels. And presumably, part of this will be determined through the acquiring of the extended submerged land lease and getting our permits, so DEP will weigh in on that. But presumably, it'll have the same 72-hour um, time limit that our other recreational floating docks have. Ooh, that's more favorable than I thought. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Godfrey. Mr. Pringle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Meeks, uh, one of the questions, is, of course, is you working with uh, Beth with the ADA, all of that, and also are you considering uh, the kayaks and uh, accessibility when you're updating all this accessibility for the ADA and also with kayakers? Yeah, um, so by law, all of our new facilities and our new programming has to have an ADA accessible component to it. And so one of the things that we've done here with the North Shore Kayak Launch is to make sure that we've got an accessible, a paved, a, a concrete um, walkway all the way from the parking, the roadside parking, down to that kayak launch. And then looking at the actual um, stabilization that they used on the ground for the kayak launch itself, making sure that that was something that, within reason, uh, was usable for a variety of individuals. And also, could you uh, email me the uh, plans? Yes, or you can. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Pringle. Mr. Hodges? Uh, thank you. Uh, to the chair, is this going to be referred to a subcommittee, or is, should we ask those kind of questions today, or? No, there will be a subcommittee, and I'll address that after we get done with this presentation. We'll, we'll do the traditional subcommittee thing. Okay, well then I'll just ask one question. In the, um, it, uh, I'm, uh, Commissioner Shine used to be bring these things up, so I, it's a little tradition here, and that is we're replacing the Lonnie um, Wern Thing, 145,000 to replace that hole. It's a pretty good sized pier out there and to do this uh, Charles Reese Memorial Fishing Pier and Kayak Launch is uh, $300,000? I mean... Uh, uh, yes. So that is true. Um, there's a little bit more to the Charles Reese one. So we're putting in a fishing pier and we're putting in a kayak launch. There is a, it's a, the fishing pier is a new facility, so you have a little bit more clearing and site prep than you have when you're going into making repairs. And then also the boat ramp that's out there, the existing boat ramp, it's not currently used because it's in poor condition. So this project will um, rehab and modify that concrete boat ramp as well. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hodges. Uh, Council Member Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the boat ramp that you mentioned, uh, I think you said that will be a kayak launch going forward. Is, is there not an opportunity to keep a boat ramp there for uh, boaters, motorized boaters? There's not. When we looked at it, it was, it was historically a motorized boat ramp, and just through time and use of that facility and just kind of a, the flow of the river, a lot of the vegetation grew up, a lot of the silt came in, um, and it's a real steep boat ramp. It probably wasn't ever the best boat ramp, um, and it really makes more sense that if we want to keep water access to turn it into a non-motorized boat, because a motorized boat one won't be very usable for people with any size boat, you know, other than just a little flat bottom John boat. Um, and it will just be very hard to maintain access for them. My second question is about the South Bank River Walk and the, uh, the floating docks. I know at this point the river cruise boats aren't moving, but at some point when we build these new docks, is there an opportunity to find a better location for those river cruise boats? The challenge with the river cruise boats is the depth of the water. So they have a little bit more of a draft on them than a regular recreation boat does. And the South Bank River Walk, um, along the river along the South Bank River Walk, is fairly shallow in most places. Uh, where those two dinner cruise boats are is one of the two deep places. 
Um, the other deep area is actually right there in front of the, it's right around the corner, it's right there in front of the condos still, and they actually have a submerged land lease the condos do to put in a marina there. Um, we have looked in the time that I've been here, we've looked at the South Bank, we've looked at the North Bank, and really that's our major challenge is the depth of the water along the river walks, north and south. Um, that's certainly something that we could probably look at as part of the maritime management plan, um, but I don't readily have a suggestion for them. Well, well, as you know, that was part of District 4, and I've received a lot of complaints about the noise of those boats and those type of things, and um, folks that live there shouldn't have to put up with that, so I would really appreciate us trying to find another location for those boats. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Councilmember Ferraro? Yes, through the chair to uh, Ms. Meeks. Um, I really like all the all the things that are coming through here. Um, the problem that I, I see is going on what Mr. Hodges said and um, Councilman Cressenbenny on the designs. It seems like we're spending by far just too much money on, on redesigning something that it, I just I have a hard time seeing where we're spending the money on that part. Are you referring to the design for the South Bank River Walk floating dock? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, when you are putting in a new floating dock, we have to not only do the design of the floating dock itself, we have to work with the state to get the submerged land lease modified and in this case extended. Um, we have to get all of our permits from the um, regulatory agencies at the state and Army Corps of Engineers. And so there's a lot more that goes into it other than just drawing what the floating dock is going to look like out in the plans. And that's just the cost. I know this committee has has grappled with the cost of things for quite some time over the number of years that I've been here, but those are our cost estimates. We didn't see, staff didn't see a way to, to push that down other than if we wanted to reduce the length of the floating dock, which we don't really want to do that. So there is no other way of reducing the price that is a fixed cost where we have no control over with, with the state or anything? We. Are we just stuck with it? Um, well, it's not a fixed cost in the, in the sense that you can go to a different design firm and they can give you different quoted prices and then we can modify our facility so we can make it you know, longer, shorter, narrower, wider, and that will impact the cost. A lot of the design cost is man hours and, and time that it takes for the consultants to work with these regulatory agencies in order to acquire the, the paperwork that's needed for us to move forward. And that's most of your cost for the, your design of the waterways facilities. Um, when this goes out, when this is approved, we can look at either going with our continuing contractors that we have for the city or we can put it out to bid. Um, we can certainly pursue putting it out to bid and see if we can get a more competitive cost estimate, but the cost estimate that we're presenting is based on our discussions with our current contractors. Yeah, could you put me on that list of seeing what that is? I'd like to see what some of the costs are also with the state and things like that. Yes, I, you, I will send you a breakdown for okay. that. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Ferraro. Uh, let the record reflect that Councilman Brown has joined us, a former uh, chairman of this, uh, of this body a few years back. All right, any further questions for Ms. Meeks? All right, Ms. Meeks, can you send Ms. Morales the, uh, the, let's say, the next six projects that you were contemplating? And yes. uh, if anybody, we'll send this to a subcommittee for a review and a report back to this body. If you have an interest in serving on that subcommittee, please let Ms. Morales know. Send her an email with your, um, with your desire to serve on that, and we'll put something together on Monday of next week based on the responses. If there's no responses, we won't have a subcommittee. All right. Mr. Brown, are you here for anything in particular? Just visiting. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Meeks. And uh, the, the packet that you passed out, is it different from the one that you submitted to Ms. Uh, Morales ahead of time? The presentation is the same. Okay. I added for you guys two attachments on the back end. One was a table that just summarized what we talked about. Okay. And the other one was the timeline that shows the running, what we've done for the last um, several years since 2013, and kind of projects into the future when we need to move forward with these other projects so that we uh, maintain compliance with our grants. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Ms. Morales, you'll need to add those to your record, though, okay? 
All right, uh, item seven, St. John's River status report on water quality and the manatee, monthly manatee report. Uh, Dr. Pinto, Dr. White, who's gonna lead off? Morning, I'm gonna uh, try to move fairly quickly, uh, running late here today. So to comment that uh, all the rain we've been having, um, almost um, eight and two thirds inches in September, we're in our rainy season right now. And uh, this is reflected in the salinity right now in the St. John's River being relatively very low, um, actually about 0.6, 0 0.6 um, at our JU docks right now. Um, it's gone up to um, 6, 8 here recently, but on high tide, but because of, um, again, all the rain that we've seen, this um, very, very low salinity going on right now. So we're, glad, we're getting a lot of flushing in the St. John's River, which is fairly good for this time of the year and something we look forward to, to be honest. So uh, nutrients and things are sort of down. Um, temperatures starting to cool off. Uh, we've dropped from 81 down to about 77, so we're continuing to drop as it gets cooler in the afternoons. And um, so we're sort of seeing that, that trend continue. So manatees are starting to leave the area. I'll let Dr. Pinto talk about what's been going on there. Um, same thing with dolphins. We're sort of seeing that, um, that same trend that we see sort of every year. Um, sort of thinking about uh, Dr. Shortell's presentation a little bit, and I want to make a couple of brief comments. I've been attending some of the meetings about that, and uh, Chairman Crescenbeni sort of hit on it. Concern that, that the, the Central Florida Water Management Plan seems to be trending with consumption going up, while when you look at the data, it looks like the, trim, the trends are going down. And so there's a lot of, I've got some concern about the way they're, they're modeling. It's like they're um, working to make sure we have plenty of water when the trend may be going the opposite way. Um, and she talks a lot about the conservation effort, but if you actually look at the plan, you'll discover that conservation represents a very small part of the plan. And so I think we could probably do a better job in terms of planning along those lines. Um, and while I applaud the idea that we're rediverting water that is going into the River right now back in the St. John's, We've got to be careful we don't just dump a whole bunch of polluted agricultural water into the St. John's because I point out the problems they've had in the Indian River Lagoon because of the water that's being diverted in there having so many high nutrients. Last year saw massive manatee deaths, dolphin deaths, pelican deaths, et cetera. Um, the other thing that, that sort of concerns me, and this actually comes from a conversation I had with George Robbins, one of the Water Management District board members, that um, while we're paying a lot of attention to uh, the amount of water we're pulling out, we're not sort of paying a whole lot of attention to the recharge potential, and concern may be that we are paving over our recharge potential. So you sort of wonder if we've got a double whammy going on here, that while we encourage development and we pave over areas that are potentially recharging, we're continuing to pulling water out. And there's ample evidence that pulling the groundwater out has in fact impacted our surface water. I point to the Florida Springs and the problems we have there. So it's a very complex issue um, and I hope that we can continue having very meaningful discussions along those lines. Um, I will comment um, on October 24th and I'll send you all an announcement about this. We're going to have an event at JU called Science on the St. John's River. Um, Fish and Wildlife will be there, DEP will be there, Museum of Science and History, the Jack Zoo. Um, Aquajax will have mermaids there, and if you saw the morning paper, Aquajax has some pretty encouraging news. Uh, the feasibility study with, I think, a very conservative numbers uh, looks very promising. Um, but it'll be an event from 10 to 2 on Saturday. We've got a fishing clinic at 11 o'clock, um, a seafood lunch. We'll have free rods and reels for the first 220 children. We're asking $10 donations uh, from adults, children are free. Uh, boat rides on the RV Larkin, and we in fact have a live lionfish in our tank at JU, so you can come by and see the live lionfish. So, with that, I'll ask Dr. Pinto to talk a little bit about what's going on with manatees in the river. Dr. White, what was the date of that? Uh, Say again. The date of your October twenty fourth. Okay, and um, the seafood lunch is that going to be lionfish? Uh, regretfully, no. But that's we'll, we can work out in the future. Yeah, I think you ought to think about that. All right, Dr. Pinto. Uh, very briefly, uh, we have not had the uh, uh, opportunity to fly in the last month, partly because of the weather, too. But um, if you recall, in August, we had 109 manatees in the area, and they are leaving town, uh, heading south on their annual migration south again as the weather cools. 
Um, on September the 4th, we did have a, man a manatee death, a watercraft death around Blunt Island. Um, unfortunately, the animal was decapitated. Um, that brings our total to eight deaths for the year, with one of them being a watercraft death. And that's all I have. All right, thank you, sir. Any questions for Dr. White or Dr. Pinto? All right, thank you all for being here. Um, St. John's River Issues Update, Ms. Reineman from the St. John's River Keeper. Almost good afternoon, but good morning. Lisa Reineman, St. John's River Keeper. Thank you all for your the time um, this morning. And appreciate the presentation by Dr. Shortell. As you know, we've been very engaged working with leaders in Central Florida on this um, extremely controversial issue. Unfortunately, we do believe it has been a flawed process. Um, there are being decisions that are being made in Central Florida, five county area, that will set water policy and water supply decisions that will impact all of the downstream communities, as well as all 18 counties in the St. John's River Water Management District. That is why you see opposition throughout many counties, including the Duval delegation unanimously opposing water withdrawals that are in the plan just two weeks ago. This body, the city council, unanimously approving a, or approving a resolution opposed to water withdrawals on multiple occasions, as well as our new mayor, um, Curry, coming out in opposition to the unsustainable plan. I brought this issue up to uh, Mr. Lindahl, as well as Mr. Beltrain, at a 2014 meeting. They were unaware in the other districts that there was so much concern in Northeast Florida, and I'd hope that these more robust discussions would more happen sooner than later. We have had some discussions and have ongoing meetings now um, with representatives from all the districts, but unfortunately the plan is at the finish line. There is a vote this month by the steering committee. There's a vote in November by all three districts, and they do include more than 150 million gallons of water a day from the St. John's River. Um, we believe the plan is flawed because it prioritizes unsustainable surface water withdrawals over sustainable conservation. While we've made some progress, there's still a lot of low-hanging fruit on conservation, and by prioritizing water withdrawals, that will undermine the millions of dollars that Dr. Shortell had mentioned that will be invested in the restoration and improving water quality health of the St. John's, as well as the millions that have been invested previously. It will further degrade the St. John's River, it is unsustainable. Um, and she mentioned it is further upstream, but what happens when you take that significant amount of water out further upstream, it undermines the whole entire base flow of the St. John's River, and there's a domino effect. The St. John's is a spring-fed river. We're showing a serious decline in our springs, and that, that impact is more connected in that section of the river than here, and it will have the trickle-down effect all the way to the mouth of the St. John's. And all of this is, is underscored by the fact that in the place Plan, they are capping water conservation investment at $3 per thousand gallons of water produced. So if you have a project that's water conservation, it has to be capped. You can't spend any more than $3 per thousand gallons. On the flip side, for surface water projects, it's capped at $8. So just by allowing more money to be invested, it shows that priority. priority. In fact, only 6% is used for water conservation in the plan. So there's much more that can we be done. We actually had water planners do a model to see how one of the many projects, the many um, plans that could be implemented for conservation by simply changing the building code could triple the amount of water savings that this plan is saying they can do over a 20-year period. So there is more room for improvement in water conservation. Um, in addition to lowballing the water conservation numbers that can be produced, we believe they're justifying the surface water projects by high highly inflated, bloated numbers for water demand. First, we're concerned about the fact that they're using population demand. It's a very steep increase. It's not based in historic numbers, and we believe it's much too steep. So it's inflating the demand projections. In addition to that, Dr. Shortell mentioned that the actual
actual use in the Central Florida Water Initiative is 800 million gallons a day. But in fact, at a workshop on Monday, Water Management District staff said the actual use today is 700 million gallons a day. It's actually less than 700 million gallons a day. And that's due to that drop due to water conservation. There has been improvement in Central Florida. There has been improvement throughout the state. There needs to be more improvement throughout the state. We all need to focus on robust conservation and living within our water means. But the Central Florida Water Initiative is using an outdated per capita number for residential. Um, today, per capita use residential in those five counties is 100 gallons per person per day. But they're using an outdated number of 122 gallons per person per day because it's a 2010 number that hasn't been updating in the planning process. We can do better than using five, uh, data that's five years old, that's driving a demand that's not necessarily based in reality. And that's why it's one of the reasons this plan is, is, is not justified properly. In addition, we mentioned the water supply impact study. That's the study that's looking at can water be pulled out of the St. John's. In fairness to the district, it is better science than we've ever had on this issue, and it rose out of controversy over the 2008 um, permit to have 5 million gallons withdrawn from the St. John's. But there are recommendation after recommendation that the National Resource Council peer review mentioned that undermines the validity and the accuracy of that plan. We have summarized all of those concerns that the National Independent Peer Review actually conducted, including the fact that the water supply impact study operated within a range of constraints that ultimately imposed both limitations and uncertainties on the study's overall conclusions. One of those conclusions being there's plenty of water because sea level is rising, and with more development, you're going to have more runoff. Those two things will have major implications to water quality, and we've asked for all of these issues and recommendations to be addressed before a decision, before a vote is made, and we're still waiting for a response from the district. So for all those reasons, I ask you to still question what is being proposed, how that will impact all the downstream counties, and urge the steering committee as well as the water management districts to reject this plan until we get more answers to our questions. I'll stop there for any comments on that. Any questions or comments from the commission on that subject? I don't see any. Okay. Um, and one other issue, I'm going to skip the dredging update. Not much has happened since I saw you last month. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to meet with you individually. Um, but I do want to follow up on a question that I think Commissioner Hodges asked me last week month about Georgia Pacific. As you know, back in 2012, Georgia Pacific started pumping their discharge into the main stem of the St. Johns River. As part of that permit, they were required to do a biological survey to do two years pre-pipeline, two years post-pipeline. And those studies have come back. I say studies because there were actually two of them. We requested the results of, those, uh, of the study that was a permit requirement, and we were actually given two studies. Our technical team reviewed those studies, and uh, there are some very serious differences between the two studies. There's conflicts um, within the studies, a lot of confusion. So we actually contacted one of the scientists that conducted one of the studies, the study that was actually authorized by the permit, and he agreed that there is some misleading information out there with the two competing studies. However, there's only one study that's a permit requirement, and this is what we know. We know based on Dr. Gross's study that was required in the Georgia Pacific permit by DEP that it appears that there is a significant shift in bio biological integrity in the St. Johns River in that section that was studied. The study was not broad enough to determine whether it was GP's impact with the discharge or whether it's base and wide. But we do know there is a concern there that cannot be ignored, and it needs to be addressed. As part of the permit, there was a benchmark that was set. And due to the permit that's being used for compliance, that benchmark has been breached, which will require Georgia Pacific to do more monitoring and more study of what's going on post-pipeline post uh, with has the discharge in the St. John's. I contacted um, DEP yesterday. They do not have an answer on if they're going to require more monitoring or not. 
but we they should have an answer by the end of the month but this is something that we should be concerned about not only in regards and discussions with future pipeline permitting dis, um, options but also this is a transitional area of the St. Johns River the water withdrawal conversation we've had earlier the dredging all of that this is ground zero we need to get our arms around it we need to ask DEP to explain what is happening and to do further study to answer what we don't know in that section and that's all at this time. Thank you, Ms. Reineman. Any questions or comments from the commission members? You're getting off easy today. I am today. It must be the late hour. And it is afternoon, so you all have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. All right, new business. Any new business to come before the commission? Mr. Pringle. Yes, sir. I would like to ask Beth Meyer to come up. Just give us a, a brief uh, update on the ADA facilities that are going on in our rivers and waterways. Yes, sir. I'm um, through the chair. Uh, just quickly, we um, are working on a formal presentation that I'll um, work with um, Councilmember Cress and Benny on, on bringing to the commission after the administration and all the new city council members have been able to vet the com the complexity of the Department of Justice report. And um, so as soon as we're ready, Hopefully uh, next month or maybe December, I will send in a message to Council Member Crescent and get on the um, on the agenda for a presentation. But overall, we have been working with the community over the past couple years to review and audit um, all of our uh, facilities program accessibility as far as our uh, our, our uh, peers and uh, the ability for our, our citizens to be able to participate in programs um, throughout the city, which includes our our you know fishing, our parks, um, our our facilities uh, across the board. So, um, Mac Blatton, our ADA project manager, and Mr. Pringle actually went out and reviewed some of our uh, fishing piers and and and, and docks to um, to assess, and we are working. Um, on every new project that comes in to the city, working very closely with uh, with the Parks Department and Tara on specifically access to our waterways for our citizens, and and um, we are, are making sure that all of the the piers moving forward, the parking, the path of travel is accessible to all of our citizens. We will continue to work with the community. We have brought in. Uh, this past year, um, we have included adaptive scuba, uh, adaptive kayaking, and, and uh, paddle boarding are going to be offered um, this year, 2016, for the first time. Uh, and we work with Brooks Rehabilitation as one of our partners. Special Olympics is, a, is another big partner. And uh, we had a, a, sur a surfing event at Jack's Beach this past summer that had about 600 volunteers out there and, and people uh, being able to surf for the first time. And uh, we are working on our guidelines from our state and national park system to provide, you know, path of travel and additional guidelines um, so that we can ensure our citizens have access to our parks and including our waterways. And uh, but I will I'll have something more formal, um, you know, for you um, in the near future. And I appreciate your time. Ms. Meyer, with regard yes, to uh, ADA improvements at our existing water parks, uh, boat ramps, et cetera. Um, are you compiling a list of improvements for those? I know we had a presentation uh, probably back in February from somebody from Brooks, and I know I reached out but never heard anything back from them. We had talked maybe about allocating a portion of our fine grant money to start you know, reducing this problem. So what do we have deficiencies that, that need to be addressed at our boat ramps and water access points that are part of the park system? Yes, sir. We're going through those and assessing those. Um, uh, we do, I, I meet with Brooks almost uh, twice a month to go through and to see exactly where, if there's any challenges. But we, you know, the, the facilities are easy because it's strictly to the building code. It's very easy to go in and assess. When we're looking at a dirt path or a path that needs to be um, there that isn't, that's, that's a new challenge. But we, I will work with Tara and come up with uh, a, a complete list. We have an audited uh, uh, 15 um, uh, fishing piers and board ramps, and we have audited that. We'll, we will go through that and, and give you that presentation. I'll make sure that's included in that. Yes, sir. When? 
Uh, I can have it for your next meeting. Okay, let's do that. Uh, okay. We're embarking on this find process. Yes, and um, who are you working with at Brooks? I work with Alice Krauss. She's, she's in charge the of the. She's came and spoke. Yes, yeah, right. we partner with them on a lot of. Okay. All right. Any questions from the commission, Mr. Pringle? Sorry. Uh, I did spend uh, two days with Mac uh, going through uh, several of the facilities, which some of them are ADA uh, spec, but there is a lot of the uh, waterways. Uh, Places and boat ramps that uh, need a lot of a lot of work in our park system. So uh, Beth is doing a great job. And like I said, I spent two days going through them, driving around, and taking them out. But uh, it is getting better. And are are these facilities that you're looking at? Are they part of the DOJ? Complaint? Yes, sir. Okay. Any yes, sir. Anything. Some of it was visited by the DOJ. Some of them ha were not visited, but we're still required to address, and we are doing that. All right. I'll have it for you at the next meeting. All right, that would be great. Any other questions from uh, the commission? All right, thank you, Ms. Meyer. Thank you. Any other new business? How about old business? No, no, no old business? Okay, we have public comments then. I have one speaker card, Mr. Nooney. Mr. Nooney, your clock is starting now. Hello, uh, my name is John Nooney, 8356 Bascom Road, Jacksonville, Florida, 32216, District 4, School Board District 3, House District 12, Senate District 4, Congressional District 4. When people say to me we're getting more public access and economic, economic opportunity on our waterways in Jacksonville, I say no we're not. We're going to get crushed, just crushed. What I want, I, this past weekend, and uh, I have this, this is a front page of the Portland Press and like to have that submitted for the permanent record. And let me just share this with you. Now, I was up in Portland you know, this weekend, and here's the front page. Which, which Portland? Portland, Maine. Gotcha. And uh, here's the front page. Of course, it's not the Times Union. It's still uh, here, front page. Four years in prison for taking 4.6 million intended for the needy. Underneath that is another he headline. EPA has double standard for tribal waters. Underneath that, campaign launches to save former floating White House. That's like our USS Adams. And here's another one. Ex-crew members say age, condition, put ship at risk. And that was the El Faro sinking. But here's this guy. You know, 15 years, he was with the not-for-profits embezzled 4.6 million, the largest fraud case in the state of Maine. Underneath this, we're going with our tribal waters. And when I'm looking about, when I think about that, I think of our downtown, our DIA, you know, that CRA, that community redevelopment area. 4.8 miles is a river's edge zone from the Fuller Warren Bridge to the Matthews Bridge. We have some of the most restricted waterways now that are gonna be moving forward you know, in that area. And I am so concerned about the public and economic access. Let me just go back here. Today you had a presentation on the Mar Maritime Management Plan. You know what that legislation was? That was 2013, 380. And yes, that was Co Council Member Shine, you know, who uh, got that started. But remember this, that's fine money. That's a property tax money. So now we're taking the power of those decisions and moving it from the people now to another group. I have a concern with that. And you know, right now, my biggest concern, and I think one of the biggest embarrassments out there, is an ADA handicapped Watercroft hand launch next to our South Bank River Walk, next to the Duval County Public School building, right next to JEA. You know, that was a 2013 fine recommendation opportunity. And remember, 2014 190, that was the South Bank River Walk, $2 million short. We don't even have an ADA parking spot there. Thank you, Mr. Nooney. What a joke. Got any questions for Mr. Nooney? All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you being here. Uh, again, well, thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the current events in Maine. Uh, 
Again, if anybody has an interest in serving on the fine subcommittee, please notify Jessica by the end of this week, Friday at 5 p.m., and we'll make that announcement next week. And uh, with that, I think our next meeting, Ms. Morales, will be on November 9th, is it, I believe? Is it on this sheet? November 12th. Oh, that's right. We had to bump it. So we'll be meeting on a Thursday, not a Wednesday, because of the Monday holiday that week. All right, if there's nothing else to come before this commission, again, thank you all for your perseverance today. I know we had a lot on our agenda, and this meeting is adjourned.